Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the third session of BTO's annual conference 2022. It's a great pleasure to welcome you today. My name is Yayan Evans. I'm Director of Engagement at BTO, and I'll be chairing today's session. Um, today, um, during the session, your cameras will be switched off, so don't worry, we won't be able to see you. And there's no chat function, but there is a question and answer function through which you'll be able to submit your questions. Now, whether you're a regular conference attendee, if you've been to a few sessions this week already, or this is your first time, a very, very warm welcome to you. It's great to have you here with us. We've got three fantastic talks lined up for today, and there'll be time for questions at the end of each talk. Uh, please ask any questions about the talks through the question and answer function, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, even if you don't have a question yourself, uh, have a look in there during the talks, because if you spot any questions that you would like to know the answer to, you can vote them up using the um, functions in there to give them greater prominence and make it more likely that those are the questions that will be asked during the time we have in the sessions. If you've got questions of a more general nature about BTO, the best opportunity to ask these will be at the AGM on Saturday. We're providing 11 free talks this week, as well as our AGM. Uh, the, we can only do this thanks to the support of BTO members. So a huge thanks to all of you uh, who are BTO members that are on the call today. Income from memberships and donations make up almost half of our charity's income. And without your support, the BTO just wouldn't be the organization it is today. Thank you so much. If you're in a position to make an extra donation to support our work, we'd be really grateful and you can do so at the special conference link you can see on your screen now, bto.org forward slash support. Uh, it's really through the membership support that we can inspire, inform and make a real difference for our birds. If you're not a member already and you enjoy today's talks and feel like a BTO is an organisation you'd like to support, then please do consider joining us as a member. Uh, today's uh, sessions are all about uh, some of our monitoring work and the first speaker will be Dr Greg Conway who is a senior research ecologist. He has uh, had a varied career working on a wide range of projects and on a wide array of species. Uh, to some of us he's known as Trapper Greg and uh, some of you may recall that a few years ago uh, a large supermarket chain was talking about getting a sniper into uh, pick off a particularly problematic pied wagtail that was terrorizing customers in their stores. Uh, Greg was the man we turned to to help, and he uh, quickly attended the supermarket, surveyed the lie of the land between the cereal aisles and the clothing aisles, set up his nets, and bish bash bosh, 10 minutes later, uh, the pied wagtail was being safely released outside, much to everybody's relief. Now, uh, Given his vast experience, I'm sure Greg has got a lot more pied wagtail tales he could uh, tell us about, but we've told him that he's got one job today, and that's to talk about woodcock. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to senior research ecologist Dr. Greg Conway to talk about the woodcock breeding survey. Over to you, Greg. Thank you, Jan. That's an interesting introduction. Um, so moving on from pied wagtails, today we'll be looking at woodcock. And we'll, so we'll have a bit of an overview of the talk then today. So we'll look at a bit about the basic biology of woodcock. And then we'll look about what we know about the change in breeding population, as long as it's a population where numbers have reduced quite um, drastically over the last 50 or so years. And then we'll look at a bit about migration movements. So we have different populations in Britain at different times of year. And then look at some of the potential causes of decline. Um, this is quite a, a difficult area to um, get some good data. As we'll see, woodcock is not the easiest species to study. And then we'll come to the important bit of why we need another survey. So the previous surveys were in 2003 and 2013. So 10 years later, we're very keen to get an update on the actual status of the population. And then the other key bit is how people can get involved with the survey. So coming back to the woodcock itself, it's a very mysterious bird really, it's, it's a nocturnal species and it's got very cryptic plumage so it's not very easy to observe at all. Um, and it is also the only wader species we have in Britain and Ireland which is a, a woodland dwelling species. And in terms of habitat, so it's a say, woodland species, um, so basically it uses woodland for nesting, also roosting during the daytime and then um, 
also sort of obviously uplands as well um, in parts of northern England it will use sort of heather moorland or the fringes of woodland so not necessarily totally restricted. In terms of other habits and really so in terms of feeding it's basically reliant on worms and other sort of soil borne invertebrates and for these it will try to obviously obtain those in woodland in the summertime but then in winter these birds change their habits completely and go to feed in quite open um, sort of pasture farmland so quite a, a swap. So looking at the behaviour of um, woodcock themselves the males do this very distinctive roading display flight and this is purely to attract females. So males are polygamous, they'll attract any female they can. Um, so they tend to fly around sort of quite extensive routes. Um, and these can cover over a, a one kilometer square. And even some of the work um, has been done with the tracking work by GWCT has shown that some birds can fly over five kilometers in an evening. So they do cover quite a bit of ground in search of these females. Lifespan wise, they live for about four years on average. And in terms of nesting, the nest, nice one up in the top corner there of four eggs. And for the most part, they appear to be single brooded. OK, the breeding season is quite spread out uh, with birds starting maybe as early as April in some years and then going through into July. But as you can see from the picture down at the bottom right there, I mean, their plumage is superbly adapted to blend in with the dead leaves where they locate their nests um, and they just basically sit there until anything literally comes up to them and touches them to try and make them move. So coming back to the, the region distribution, globally, they're very widespread in the sort of boreal sort of forest region across much of Northern Europe, right across Asia, uh, which is the green area. And then the blue is where they go for winter. Um, you'll notice in Britain and France, we've got some dark green where they're basically resident, where we have birds during the summer and winter. But for the most part, birds in the northern part of the breeding range have to move out of winter once the winter freeze comes. Uh, they can't feed there, so they have to keep heading much further south. And so the global population is estimated about 11 and a half million. Um, and that appears to be generally stable at the moment. However, there have been decreases, obviously, in Britain, also in France, on the edge of the range, which is quite notable, but then also in Estonia. And that's balanced slightly by recent increases in Finland, but um, generally we've got very uncertain data about the individual countries and their population trajectories, but generally the situation seems to be moderately stable. And because the populations are globally is generally stable, these are classed as least concern from the IUCN Red List. Uh, coming back to Britain, so we have a wintering population of about sort of 0.8 to 1.4 million. Um, and that's balanced by a British resident population of about 55,000 males. Um, and that's based on the 2013 survey. So basically in winter, we get a, a massive um, incursion of birds from much further east, which we'll see about their origin shortly. So coming on to the set of timing of migration. So we've got a nice plot here from bird tracks. So the red line is um, the sort of long-term pattern of occurrence. So percentage of lists which record them in each weekly period. And then the blue line is the actual track for this year. And so quite nice to draw the attention to the arrival of wintering birds in the blue box here. Um, we can see that the blue line actually is quite below the red line. So this is partly a consequence of the very mild conditions in November where birds have stayed at their breeding sites longer and only started to move when the conditions have finally become cold and pushed them back to the west. And interestingly, we've got a high peak at the moment right into the end of November. So we've got a last late rush of birds making the migration over here. And interestingly, in the spring as well, again, 2022 was a very um, atypical year, weather-wise very warm. And again, we can see the blue line for the um, current year, the reporting rate is much lower than the red line. And that tells us that the birds are departing earlier. So if the conditions on the breeding grounds are warmer, they can set off earlier and get back in good weather conditions. So coming on to the migration movements, I mean, this is quite complex, really. Um, I'll pop up the key down at the bottom here. So the different colours indicate the timings when the birds were ringed. And as we see in Britain, um, the majority of the birds are ringed in the winter time. That's when it's easiest to catch them out in the open fields. But we have got a few movements of um, birds in Scotland and northern England. And these birds ringed in the breeding season have moved then into um, Ireland and into the southwest. But really, despite all the ringing data we do have, we have 
very little information to relate the movements of British breeding birds um, between breeding and wintering sites. However, the wintering birds, uh, they come from a vast array of um, destinations and some at considerable distance, thousands of kilometers. Uh, but principally, most of these come from sort of Finland, Scandinavia, and then sort of Western Russia and the Baltic states. Um, again, these birds are having to move out of these areas because they've become uninhabitable. And Britain and Ireland offers its a warmer climate um, and abundant pastures, which is ideal for them. Coming on to a little bit of the tracking work that GWCT have undertaken with GPS tracking. So these show different individuals and in addition to the ringing data, these actually show the tracks the birds have actually taken. So we know the exact routes rather than a point A and a point B from start and finish. We can see these birds go out. Um, so there's a pinky one here, the MO monkey bird. That obviously gone out to its breeding site and has pretty much come back along the same track that it went out. But others have slightly more um, elaborate loops, such as the bird in so a pinky red, the PI bird. But this just gives an indication of um, which routes birds take to and from. And also this is useful because it does tell us then when birds don't come back. Because if the weather's mild, some birds will stop off on the continent and won't necessarily need to come back to Britain if the conditions are milder further east. So coming on to the, the distribution change. Um, so this is a map from the Atlas. And the key thing here is the black triangles. So this is from the 1970s and these black triangles indicate where birds have been lost from 10 kilometer squares. So we've got massive losses really from Ireland, um, central and western England, and also throughout Scotland around the periphery of the range. So these are continuous pink areas are where the population has been maintained throughout this period. But generally it's a pattern of decline and range contraction. And as for most species, when populations are in decline, birds which would use suboptimal habitats on the fringes of the range are used the first ones to be lost from those habitats and birds contract back to the core habitat. So that's useful for us to know, knowing that the birds now which are using the core habitat, we can understand what makes that habitat more suitable and that can help us manage um, woodlands in future. So overall that's led to an over 50% decline and that led to the species being red listed um, due to that range decline. Um, over that 50, or 50 year period. Coming on to look at the breeding abundance from the atlas. So the key thing here is to look at the darker sort of blue gray squares. And this shows that birds have declined the most in those darker blue areas. Okay, there's been some increases in the orange, but generally even across the core range, we've got um, quite considerable reductions in abundance, which is obviously quite a concern. So this indicates it's not necessarily an edge of range, is range issue. Um, but other factors are impacting birds right across the whole breeding distribution. So the breeding distribution itself is quite interesting to look at. So very much focused along these sort of areas with um, high woodland cover, such as New Forest in the south. And then we've got these sort of Northern English up from woodlands and into Scotland. And that's quite a contrast really with the wintering distribution from the Atlas. So the wintering abundance here, the darker the blue, the more birds there are. And we can just sort of pinpoint a couple of areas. So if we take Wales and the southwest of England, we'll see we've got very few breeding birds here, so virtually none now in the southwest of England. But in winter, there's a very high abundance of these winter migrants in the continent. Um, but also, we don't really know how our British birds move as well during winter, whether they stay close to their breeding sites or whether they move to the more um, sort of pastoral and milder areas into the southwest. So coming on to the National Survey results, so back in 2003, we had around 79,000 um, males recorded by the survey, and that is in 800 um, survey squares. And that's in contrast then to the 2013 survey, where we had this 29% decline in the number of males, which dropped to about 55,000. And that's with a similar number or slightly more survey squares covered. So we've increased the coverage, but yet the population has declined by over a third. So coming on to um, some of the annual trends and sort of why numbers do vary from year to year. So between the national surveys, we have been surveying a, a subset of sites just to really see how the numbers do fluctuate from year to year, because these 10 year surveys are okay for snapshots, but don't really tell us the underlying patterns necessarily. Um, but it is quite a complex issue really. So we've got quite a mix of factors, which we'll come to have a look at in a moment, but certainly a combination of impacts of survival, environmental change, environmental management and breeding output all contribute to these fluctuations. So 
where there's high production of young, we'll expect to see a little sort of increase um, in some years, such as in 2016. But then after a cold weather event um, where survival during winter is low, we'll expect to see a little drop, and that's pretty much what happens here. But this uh, plot is quite all over the place, and just to put a little context on that, this is really down to the number of sites covered. So prior to 2013, which is the dashed line here, we only had about an average of 27 sites covered. So there's quite a lot of fluctuation in numbers from year to year. And also as habitat changes, the number of males on a patch will decline over time. So that's partly related to that. Then things get reset in 2013. And then with a the much larger sample of sites, over 150 covered from year to year, we can still see that there's fluctuation from year to year, but not quite as wild. But the other sort of take home message from this is that generally over that entire period, there has been a general decline in abundance of woodcock on these sampled sites. This isn't the full survey, but just a partial um, sample of um, sites across the country. Um, but that's partly why we need that national survey to really understand what the current population is now. So coming on to some of the factors which um, affect woodcock. So survival is a sort of key factor. So even for our British birds, when we get very severe winters, then the ground's frozen, they're forced out of their local areas and they have to go west to find food. So they will typically go to the southwest of England where it's milder, the Gulf Stream influence. Um, then in exceptional conditions, they will be forced down to the near continent. And the other sort of, you know, factor related to survival is um, hunting pressure. So we know that the majority of the birds which are shot here in winter tend to originate from the Eastern European Russian populations, which are generally fairly stable. But that does mean that there are still some British birds and Irish breeding birds which are um, here in winter, which are likely to be shot as well. At the moment, we don't know what that um, actual figure is, but um, it's a small percentage, but work is underway to address that. So woodland management is quite key. So from the work we have done previously in 2013, woodlands which are extensive in area, but also have a mix of different age classes are important. So appropriate woodland management is good to give a range of age classes to give breeding habitat and feeding habitat and roading areas, of course. And deer pressure is another thing which has come to light. So woodcock nest on the ground, they need a, a bit of cover. Um, deer can impact that by basically eating away the brambles and removing the ground flora and ground cover, which limits their nesting opportunities, which may make them more susceptible to predators. And again, recreational disturbance is always a, a, a perennial problem. Um, now that more people are being encouraged to go out and use our forest, there is potential there for a bit of additional disturbance, which may just make areas less suitable for nesting rather than direct effects to um, nests themselves, which are extremely hard to find. So coming on then to breeding productivity, nice little picture here of a freshly hatched chick. Um, so there's a number of influences here really. So nesting habitat is key, as I mentioned, deer can manipulate the habitat and also just through the management itself, creating a nice sort of dense sort of shrubby layer with sort of brambles and bits of cover to give them a little bit of um, protection from approach from predators and um, <clears throat> humans, but also breeding output. So if they breed successfully, produce lots of young and they survive for the next year, that's all good and that helps boost the population. And also post fledging survival is also an important factor which we don't really consider. So even though chicks might be produced from the nest, they've then got to survive to the next um, breeding season to be able to contribute to the population. And predation is always an, a problem for ground nesting birds. So mammalian predators typically will find any ground nesting birds and sort of opportunistically sort of take what they find. And there's still uh, quite a bit of work to be done really on what um, predators do impact woodcock. So very few nests are found and we've got very little data on what actually influences nest survival. And the other sort of key thing, as we mentioned before, so with the atypical 2022 um, summer is the climate change. So summers are becoming hotter and drier. This makes the ground drier. So feeding on earthworms, these birds are quite limited in where they can feed. Um, so that means that um, even during the summer, if they can't find enough food for the chicks, that might have an impact on breeding output. Um, this is a problem which is likely to be exacerbated in the future and more likely maybe to affect the southern part of the range, which might explain some of the um, patterns we're seeing, which we will try to address in the next analysis after the next survey. <clears throat> 
So coming up back to why we need that national survey. So the key thing is then to get this um, up to date figure for the actual breeding population numbers and the distribution to see how that's changed since 2013. And then to provide more detailed information on what is required in terms of breeding habitat requirements and that can influence uh, management future. And also another sort of key output from this, which is eagerly awaited, is to understand how the population has changed. And this will be a key factor in policies into um, changes to shooting uh, practices. So how do we um, survey woodcock? I mean, it's a difficult bird, so they're nocturnal, spend most of the time at night. We can't just go out and sort of count them in flocks. Um, the birds are very mobile, so we don't get them all together in one place at one point in time. Um, so it's quite a difficult species, really. So we have come up with a, a sort of pretty much a bespoke method for these, really, which is then related to the um, roading behaviour. So we take um, one kilometre squares with a certain amount of woodland in them. So the squares are stratified by the amount of woodland. And within that, we can also put our survey point within the woodland or up to 400 metres outside. So the squares are separated by quite a distance. There's no overlap, so we don't double count birds. And then we locate our count point within the woodland, ideally within a, a clearing or on a wide trackway, which the birds use as, as a roading arena uh, and pass over it. So it's key to have a good view of the site. This is a typical example here, one which David Norfolk took uh, of his site, a nice open track with a good view of the sky and really easy to pick up woodcock for um, vocally or visually. So the survey itself requires um, visits during May and June. This requires three main counting visits of about 75 minutes duration, starting 15 minutes before sunset, um, and then staying for an hour afterwards, and then just counting all the birds that were seen or heard um, over the site, um, just making a note of their numbers. And the key thing is to say, select that good count point. And for those who've been involved previously this year, we'll be getting people to reselect their count point. As habitat changes, um, it's important to make sure you do move to site, which gives you the best options for detecting woodcock. So we'll um, reassess that. And then all being well, everyone will be lucky enough to see a woodcock fly in over their site. So in terms of habitat, I mean, habitat structure is important here. We've got a nice a bit of open woodland for easy flight, and then the ground floor is quite um, important. So understanding this across the sites where they are currently and where they've been lost is also very important. So we've revised our habitat recording this year. So for each count point, we'll put a, a 200 meter buffer around the actual site itself. And within that, we'll record the uh, amount of woodland and the type of woodlands and more importantly, the structure. So we need to know tree species, what the ground vegetation is like. And then we've got this annotated score here to try and help capture the structure of the woodlands in terms of the sort of tree density and the sort of understory and ground flora. So in this example, we've selected a T2, so it's a tall stems with a pretty continuous um, set of ground floor bracken over sort of half a metre. And then we've selected that as D2 for the density of vegetation. So we've got very high cover of bracken over the ground, um, which is also an important factor. So then coming on to where the sites are. So we've got over a thousand sort of key squares we want to get covered. So there should be pretty much um, a survey square everywhere. Obviously, we've got our team of annual counters, which will continue to count theirs. Um, but there's a, a vast variety of sites to be looked at. Um, so the other sort of key area we need to focus on is Scotland, where we need to improve coverage. That's where the core population is centred now. So getting more intensive count data on that is really useful to really refine our population estimates. And also Northern Ireland, where we hope to be able to provide a population estimate for the first time. And the key thing like I said is to get counts where birds, you know, where there are zero counts, we still need to know the habitat associated with them so we can then sort of understand why birds have been lost in particular areas. So even if there are no birds present on your site, that information is just as important as the sites which produce sightings of birds. So when you come to be able to select your site, we've sort of changed the setup slightly. So the yellows are the really high priority sites, the blues are also high priority, but not quite so essential. So if you go in, you can select the yellows. And just to make a point that the beta website is being upgraded at the moment. So this information will be there from around the 19th of December. We'll have the square um, request system set up and all the survey guidance and information. So if you can sort of hold off on them, but yeah, please keep an eye on the BTO website. So I'll finish by thanking our collaborators at GWCT, that be Andrew Hoodless and Chris Hewitt, who've been instrumental in a lot of pioneering woodcock research. 
uh, BTO regional organisers team and all the volunteers who've contributed to previous surveys and also undertaken the annual monitoring and not to get all the landowners and managers who've allowed permission to their site. So again, please come back to have a look at the BTO Woodcock website um, a bit later in December and I'll be happy now to take any questions. Thank you, Greg. That was a great talk on a fascinating species. I know that a lot of people would be interested in doing that survey. So uh, we've got time for a few questions. And uh, the first one is from our old friend, Keith Cowison. Hi, Keith. Uh, he asks, I think you answered this in the talk, is the, Brit is the visiting British wintering population likely to diminish through short stopping in Finland, Estonia, etc., as the climate warms? That's a good question. I mean, there's certainly evidence from the tracking work that some birds are short stopping. So, so rather than coming up to Britain, they stop partway back in the low countries or even sort of further east. Um, if winters continue to become milder, then that's quite likely that we will have fewer birds visiting us. And even those estimates of you know, 0 0.8 to 1.4 million, they're very sort of, um, sort of vague estimates. And that does reflect the intensity of the, or the severity of the winters. So in a mild winter, we'll get far fewer birds coming here. And that's already a, a fact from year to year. But yeah, that's a trend that sets to continue. Thanks, Greg. Another question from Keith is about the um, the link, any links between woodcock and badgers. So any correlation between burgeoning badger populations in woodcock breeding woodland and conversely recolonization by woodcock in areas where the bad, where badgers have been culled? That's a very good question. I mean, we know from our work on woodlarks and nightjars that mammalian predators such as um, foxes and badgers will find the nest of these species. So any ground nesting bird is going to be prone to um, them. Um, in terms of research on woodcock, I mean, it's a very difficult species to study. In terms of nest records, we only get about less than 10 a year. So very few are actually sort of um, monitored. Um, there is a move now to maybe use nest cameras. I think GWCT have got some research planned where they'll try to get nest cameras on some woodcock nests. But again, we need to get a good representative large sample to um, sort of rule out any regional biases. So it's going to be challenging to even get a decent sample on woodcock. In terms of where the badger culls have happened, I mean, that's potentially something we can look at in the analysis after the next national survey. Um, but I think the, it will depend on the range of decline, but I think it's unlikely given that the Southwest has got quite high badger abundance and that's where quite a lot of the culling has occurred um, because woodcock have just gone from there for other reasons. Um, badgers probably won't have much influence at all on them, but that's something we can attempt to address in future. That's great, Greg. A couple of survey specific questions then. Um, will the same one kilometer squares be surveyed in 2023 as in 2013? And will we be able to do dawn visits? Okay, in terms of square survey sets, so any national survey square um, from the previous surveys, that will be there in the square set. We've actually increased the number of squares. We've added in another set of, of random squares, which brings it up now, well, up by another sort of um, 500. So that should give people more opportunity to cover sites. And we've tried to set a threshold that where we've got achieved good coverage of our priority sites in the south, we'll then release more squares as that's a course that gets taken up. Um, so there will be more opportunities. And in terms of dawn visits, that's tricky. And, and a lot of the work that's been done has all focused on the evening where the peak of activity seems to occur. So in the nature of, sort of trying to keep these methods standardised, we really want to just focus on that evening. Um, we know even speech like night jars that the cheering behaviour can be sort of a bit more diminished in the morning compared to the evening. So for this survey, we'll have to try and keep everything standardised to give us a best measure of change and population estimate to keep the surveys at the evening period. Thanks, Greg. Just one last question then. Sorry for those of you who haven't had your questions answered yet. Uh, one from Toby Carter asking, would the use of thermal devices help a lot in locating birds, especially in the breeding season? Um, potentially. Um, we've tried to look at this with night jars. Uh, depends on the nature of the habitat. If you've got fairly open, uh, unenclosed habitat, then you will pick up these birds. They're quite large. They give a good heat signature, so that is quite useful. Um, but quite often they are set down in quite dense um, scrub and understory, which makes it very difficult to penetrate that with a the thermal imager. I mean, so it's worth giving it a try if the habitat is open enough. Um, but like all these things, it's not going to be a, a silver bullet and make our life that much easier. It will still require a lot of groundwork to establish where 
nesting birds are like to be, and then some quite sort of intensive searches to actually track down any nests. Right, thanks very much, Greg. We better leave it there. And perhaps you can um, answer some more of the questions in the chat if you get a chance. Um, but for now, thanks very much for a great talk. We're going to move on to uh, seabirds now, switch our focus to seabirds. And the speaker um, on this topic is going to be Sarah Harris. So Sarah has recently switched roles, having been national organiser for the Breeding Bird Survey and overseen uh, in a period when she oversaw that scheme, achieving record coverage. She's got a deep love of seabirds and spent lots of time on various beautiful islands around our coasts, con contributing data collection um, to the seabird monitoring programme. She's been a ringer since her early teens, and when not at work, she can usually be found at her beloved Spurn Bird Observatory. Some people say most reliably in the Crown and Anchor, but obviously I, I didn't say that. Uh, she's recently taken on the role of seabird monitoring programme organiser, and her talk today will will uh, take us through a new era for seabird monitoring. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, I will just make sure I'm sharing the right thing here. So I hope you can see my screen there. Okay, That's brilliant. Good. Um, so thank you very much for having me today. I look forward to talking to you about the Seabird Monitoring Programme. Um, it's very new to myself and, and BTO, um, although BTO have been uh, involved with this scheme for some time. Um, but first, let's just have a little think about um, seabird monitoring in general in the UK. So when we're thinking about UK seabirds, we're thinking about cliffs and stacks, uh, man-made structures, that could be piers, bridges, um, thinking about the Kitty Wakes in Newcastle, um, and of course inland sites as well, so term rafts, uh, gull colonies, uh, cormorant colonies, places like that. And on the right there we can see a map which illustrates the UK seabird sites that have been monitored uh, for SMP and also periodic censuses over the years. Um, so the purple dots are uh, locations that haven't been surveyed quite as much as the amber and then the green, which have been surveyed uh, most years since the survey began. Um, a lot of the purple dots, which are sites that have been covered in fewer years, most likely represent a lot of the periodic census sites. So in the UK, we're monitoring 25 seabird species. Uh, some through annual seabird monitoring program uh, surveys and others through these periodic um, species specific and census surveys. We know that um, with annual monitoring, we can see that nine of the species on this slide are showing um, a decline and the rest, um, well, 13 are showing to be stable or increasing in populations. Um, and this is out of a total of 22 species trends, um, which we have long term data for. And I say 22 out of the 25 because for three species, the Manx water, the leeches petrel and the storm petrel, um, they're very difficult species to survey, often involving um, lots of labour intensive monitoring, tape playback um, down uh, burrows and in crevices. So uh, on SCOMA alone, there's thought to be about 350,000 breeding pairs. Um, so that's a, a lot of seabird burrows to be surveying. Um, so study plots are often adopted for monitoring where annual monitoring is possible. So in Seabird 2000, which was a periodic census, um, there was a pretty good handle on Manx Shearwater and Petrol um, data. So we managed to get quite a lot of sites surveyed. So the hope is that in the most recent Seabird census, which finished last year, we should be able to start to build a picture of long-term changes in these three species. And then we should be able to have an idea between the annual monitoring and the censuses of how species are doing, uh, that all of these 25 species are doing. So bringing together um, population trends, the long-term trends from the Seabird monitoring programme, 
we can form a seabird indicator and this forms part of the uh, wild bird populations national statistics suite uh, and this uh, suite so also includes things like farmland bird indicators, uh, but also country based indicators as well. But here we have the seabird indicator and it's showing a 24% decline overall uh, since 1986. Um, so fairly worrying. And why should we be monitoring the seabird? So we've got that indicator graph that I've just shown you. Um, but also the UK hosts 8 million of the uh, globally important seabird populations here in the UK, um, and many are facing increasing pressures. So if we're thinking about Manx Shearwater, there's 80% of the global population breed here in the UK, Great Skua 60%, Gannet 56 Lesser Blackback Gull 38%, and Shag 34% of the breeding populations are here in the UK. So um, we're a pretty important place for many seabird species. So if we have a little look now um, at some of the seabird species that were part of that seabird indicator we saw a moment ago, and of course the seabird monitoring program logos, we'll start with Kittywake. Um, this is a species that inhabits coastal cliffs in the breeding season um, and is otherwise fairly pelagic. Uh, it feeds mainly on marine invertebrates and fish. We can see that long term, this species has declined across the UK by 65% since 1986. This is using the annual monitoring from the Seabird Monitoring Programme. You can see the different uh, colour lines there are for different countries. Um, there is regional variation um, and we can see that the Scottish trend and the UK trend, which is blue and red, are fairly similar because a lot of the kittiwake colonies that are monitored are based in Scotland. So there's about 250-ish sites and 146 of those in Scotland. So the UK trend is um, quite heavily influenced by Scotland. If we're thinking about why these, this species is uh, struggling, so the sand eels uh, uh, provide a high proportion of the kittiwakes diet during the breeding season. These are uh, surface feeders, so they're not diving down like the orcs are, so that kind of limits the sort of prey that they might be catching. Uh, and with climate-induced uh, warming waters, there's, become, uh, there's becoming a mismatch between the sand eel sizes uh, and availability at the crucial times of year. Um, and this is fairly regional as well. So we're seeing um, the effects are stronger in the North Sea than say the Irish Sea. So this is, as I say, climate change induced but also studies have shown that fishery pressures as well can have an impact on kittiwake colonies and by restricting um, fishery activities in certain areas can benefit nearby colonies. So that's another factor. Um, and by relieving the pressures from fisheries, that kind of takes the, the pressure off so that, that, that the climate change is kind of the, the, main, the main thing affecting this species. So if we move now to sandwich tern, which uh, inhabits sandy coastlines during the breeding season, uh, nesting colonies on the ground um, and feeds mainly on fish, which they catch from plunging down into the sea. If we look at the trend for this species, we can see that it is relatively stable with a slight increase in the last 10 years. Um, that spike that you see in 2009 was due to an influx, an influx of sandwich tern um, in uh, from continental Europe over to Minsmere in Suffolk, where 550 apparently occupied nests were recorded. Um, and then that was compared to one nest the year before and, and none for several years after that. But um, I think there's they have bred there since um, in lower numbers. But as we can say, uh, as we can see here, relatively stable overall. So disturbance can be a big factor for sandwich term breeding success. So some areas which are fenced off to prevent disturbance from 
uh, foxes uh, predating the, the nest, but also dogs, people, um, just giving them that space to breed safely um, can really help some of the populations. We're also dealing with severe weather events during the breeding season. So if you just have a big tidal surge and it can wipe out the uh, entire colony, depending where it's located. So they've got that to face as well, um, which again relates to climate change. But as uh, we see in some lo locations, local initiatives can really help, as I say, keeping disturbance down um, and predator control can boost um, the breeding season for these species in some places. So moving on now to one of my uh, kind of favourite species, uh, some uh, a species that I've been working on in the last few years with some tagging projects. So I had to mention it here. This is the Arctic skewer. Uh, so it breeds on coastal tundra and here uh, in the UK, the moorlands and crofts of Scotland. So they have a fairly varied diet. They can, uh, they're mostly um, stealing food from other seabirds. So they'll be um, taking fish from, from those, but they also eat birds, small mammals and insects as well. So pretty varied diet. But we're seeing that this species has declined by 80% since 1986, and it's a greater decline than any other of the UK seabird species. So we can see here this is the UK trend, but in truth, it's a Scottish trend, since that's the only place they, they nest in the UK. And we see in this decline. So we've recently um, tagged some birds up on Rouse uh, in Orkney and Feral. And we can see from the tagging data, we've got the orange circle, which is one of the hotspots uh, the birds visited during the autumn as they're moving south to their wintering grounds, which is the purple circles, and then back up in the spring, which is the green that you can see there. Um, and you can see that they're actually doing a little bit of a circle almost uh, using different areas in the in the spring and autumn. So we don't really know if there's additional pressures during their migration and overwintering sites, as well as on their breeding grounds. So that is something that um, could be looked in, into, and it is interesting to see that the birds from different colonies are overlapping in where they're spending their time during passage and over winter. Uh, during the breeding season, these birds are seen to be struggling. They're traveling quite long distances to forage. So we've got some more tagging data here from Feral. 14 tags and males and females travel to the same sort of locations. So historically, documents tell us that they tend to, to travel about 10 kilometers from their nesting grounds to go and forage. But we can see from the Feral data that uh, mostly they're traveling about 200 kilometers from the colony, which is quite a distance. And then there's the odd bird that goes even further down to Dogger Bank there, the 585 uh, kilometer mark. So um, traveling this far for food is obviously not going to be helping them um, with their breeding success. So there's a pressure there. And then if we look at the tag data from Rouse on Orkney, so this is data from eight tags, we can see that uh, many of the successful nesting attempts were of birds that were traveling northeast from Rouse rather than the southeast. Uh, where they were traveling further. So this is within an within colony difference in um, foraging behavior. And the birds that were traveling northeast were heading towards marine protected areas. So you can see that as a black boundary and some deeper seas off towards the northeast. So that was quite interesting and um, helps to build a picture as to why um, some colonies might be struggling more than others. So Arctic skuas are a good indicator of the wider marine health because they're, they're um, stealing food from other seabirds. So if other seabirds are struggling, such as uh, puffins and terns, then you might expect the Arctic skuas to be struggling as well. There's this trophic mix, mismatch, which we mentioned with the kitty wakes, um, where the food is not available at the right time of year. And of course, uh, that will make it more difficult for Arctic skuas to steal food from other seabirds if the other seabirds haven't got it either. Again, this can relate back to climate change. Uh, we need to find out more about their migratory and wintering locations, see if there's any pressures there. And there is um, signs that heat stress might be a problem. So again, climate change, birds are getting too hot 
sitting on their nests and they're fidgeting and they're wanting to move about. It's worth bearing in mind that most of the Arctic squirrel populations are outside of the UK and further north. So this is kind of the first sort of latitude that, that birds are beginning to struggle with um, as a result of climate change. Hunting pressure and power line collisions are things that have been suggested for colonies outside of the UK as well. And then there's also potential competition from species such as great skuas and gulls. So in general, the potential threats from um, uh, for seabird that seabirds are facing relate to climate change, um, renewables. This is a tricky one um, to help mitigate climate change. Um, we're obviously trying to install more green energy, so renewable energy such as wind turbines, which could then be impacting on seabird populations as well. So there's a bit of a, a bit of a circle there with trying to find a solution and causing potential issues. Um, as I mentioned, fisheries earlier and invasive predators, um, disturbance at colonies, pollution, whether that be oil or uh, plastics out in the sea. And then more recently, we've seen avian influenza as well. So moving back around to the seabird monitoring program itself, this is a survey which works to support the protection and conservation of our internationally important seabirds uh, through monitoring, surveillance and delivery of robust scientific evidence outre outreach and by targeting research to action effective climate um, action. So um, getting that data collected and then making it as widely available as possible for research and making it making a difference. So have a quick run through of the history of the seabird monitoring program. So I mentioned these censuses earlier, and these happen every 15 ish years um, and aim to cover as many or all of the uh, seabird sites across the UK each, year, uh, each uh, census. So we see there were two um, Two to begin with, and the second census triggered a uh, discussion about forming annual monitoring um, funded and uh, coordinated by JNCC with 19 other partners to monitor 25 seabird species every year. We then had um, a third seabird census, Seabird 2000, and this is the one I mentioned earlier where um, the first kind of comprehensive information on uh, petrels and shearwaters were collected. Um, we've just finished the fourth seabird census um, and between 2018 and 2022 um, discussions were had about um, the future of the seabird monitoring program and from that a new agreement was signed um, with partners BTO, JNCC and in association with RSPB um, and I was appointed in July 2022 to take the survey forwards. So the steering group are those three partners I mentioned a moment ago, but also we have the country nature conservation bodies coming to the steering group meetings as well and feeding into that from a country based perspective, which is really useful. Um, we've got key site coordinators, so I will come on to what key sites are in a moment. And then the partners from the previous agreement. So there's a whole suite of organizations involved with the direction of the seabed monitoring program. In Northern Ireland, we're really lucky to have funding from the Northern Ireland Environment Agency to support monitoring there. And part of the funding uh, contributes to uh, Catherine Booth Jones, who's post at BTO to coordinate seabed monitoring locally. And data feeds into the seabed monitoring program and there's annual reports as well. So it's hoped that we will increase the number of seabird coordinators we have across the UK um, in the same sort of fashion as we have for BBS and WEBS, for example, with regional organisers and local organisers to provide that local support for participants and that local knowledge, which is so important to many of our surveys. So it's an annual survey. It's uh, carried out by volunteers and professional surveyors. Um, at coastal and inland sites. The skills that were required for this survey vary hugely between sites. So you can target a specific species. So as long as you know what that species looks like, you'll be okay. Um, but the colony size and complexity of methods can vary a lot. So burrow, nest is ver uh, burrow nesting versus those 
on cliffs and you could have a small colony or you could have a huge one with thousands of birds on. So it does vary um, site by site. And we can add new sites if, uh, for example, you've got a local common tern colony that isn't getting picked up by the seabird monitoring program yet, that, that could be added and monitored. So the different sorts of data that feed into the survey, we've got breeding abundance, uh, information from colony counts. So this is going to sites and counting um, either the nests or the individuals, depending on the species. I should say that different species are monitored using different methods. So um, for some species, you'll go and count the territories, for others, count the nests, and for others, individual birds. Um, we can see there there's a herring gold trend and we can get abundance information at a country and um, regional level as well as the UK. The other half of the survey, if you like, is the breeding success. This is slightly more intense. You have to revisit the sites um, a few times to count the colonies and then check, bait, check back later to see um, how many chicks had fledged. So how well the, the breeding season had gone for those species. So there's a former graph there. And again, you've got information for different uh, countries in the UK there. In addition to that, we have triennial sites, which are managed um, by JNCC, carried out by JNCC staff um, and funded by JNCC. So these three sites are really difficult to cover. There's um, a lot of colonies to get around um, and it's a, they're very important sites for breeding seabirds. So these are monitored every three years and they feed into the seabird monitoring program as well. And we have key sites, which I mentioned earlier. Um, this, the sites are funded by JNCC. Uh, well, this work is funded by JNCC, I should say. Um, as and the um, four islands that um, we can see there um, carry out this SMP additional data collection um, as part of their, the rest of their wider work that they're doing in these locations. So that's collecting additional data on things like productivity, survival, phenology, so that's the timing of arrival and breeding um, and feeding ecology, so diet studies. So all of those are organisations um, except for CANA, which is carried out by um, local volunteers who go out there uh, for an expedition. So um, a bit of a mix there. So if we're looking at the SMP pot data from breeding success, that's productivity counts, uh, breeding abundance, this is actually counting the nests or the individual birds. Um, data from uh, key sites, uh, triannual and census data all feed into a pot. And then from that, we can get our annual trends, but also additional information which we present um, in a report each year. There are other surveys that monitor seabirds as well. So thinking about bird atlas, breeding bird survey, um, retrapping adults for survival, which involves uh, Darvik ringing, so colouring in with an individual number on uh, seabirds and seeing which ones come back and how often. And then the nest record scheme, which is looking um, specific, at specific uh, nest locations and the outputs of those individual nest sites. Um, for breeding bird survey, the two species that are monitored there are uh, common tern and cormorant. And uh, many different partners are involved with the surveys on this screen. So um, I've listed those at the bottom right there. And all of that data can help us to monitor those 25 seabird species that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. So as this is a BTO conference and I'm talking about seabirds, I really do need to mention the BTO Seabird Appeal, which was launched in spring 2021. Um, and thank everyone who donated to this appeal. Um, the aim is to provide a wider programme of work to increase capacity for seabird monitoring in the UK. So this is broader than seabird monitoring programme, but will uh, hopefully positively benefit the survey uh, long term. But it would also include um, a programme of work to encourage uh, more seabird ringing, as well as uh, retrapping adults for survival and nest record scheme, all this sort of thing that, that contributes to seabird monitoring.
So some of the things we've either been working on or, or hope to work on in the future, uh, using the funding from this appeal, we've carried out some uh, online training, so ID skills and seabird ecology, uh, seabird met methodology um, is something that we want to be doing in the future. So we're hoping to revamp the SMP handbook, which is the, the methods, uh, and do some training around that and uh, provide some additional ringing skills guidance for seabirds specifically. So this will be documents, images and videos covering uh, methods of seabird ringing and handling. Uh, Fieldwork supports, there are grants out there to uh, support ringers wanting to go to seabird colonies and gain experience on um, ringing seabirds and to help match people to seabird ringing groups. So, you know, if you're inland and you don't know many ringers, you might struggle to find a group that's going out on a seabird expedition. So it's trying to link up people and help them get out to some of these locations um, and to develop an adapter for ringing. So some of the larger pliers that are used to put on the larger bird rings are really really hard to um, close the rings and so this is an adapter you can um, fit and remove from your your ringing pliers which help you squeeze the ring shut basically so it should open up the um, audience that can go out and ring seabirds safely uh, using either small hands or weaker hands um, and yeah safely fit those rings and to provide talks. So this is something that's in development at the minute. So trying to have short talks, maybe ask an expert or uh, talks on seabird monitoring or a specific species, that sort of thing. So it's early days with the seabird monitoring program. We look forward to seeing it grow and evolve with uh, working with our partners and the wider advisory group um, to assist in the outputs from the BTO seabird appeal. Uh, and to increase monitoring across the UK. And on that note, I need to mention um, avian influenza, which is on everyone's mind at the minute. We are hoping to increase monitoring of seabirds in 2023. The census has just finished, as we mentioned, but we think it's really important to um, figure out what our priority species list is and locations for surveys to try and get a handle on the impacts of avian influenza on our seabird populations. And we understand in 2022 uh, some monitoring was not possible and the speed of the spread of the virus meant that a precautionary uh, approach was taken. But we do recognise that we need to understand the impacts of avian influenza and to find a way to continue monitoring safely um, with disturbance and biosecurity in mind. So we are having many, many meetings with uh, country agencies and other conservation organisations to figure out how we're going to do this. Um, and some of the species featuring on this priority list are kitty wake, sandwich tern, gannet and great skewer. Of course, things that have been hit pretty hard in 2022 and we can actually see that, especially for great skewer in some of the data being submitted to SMP at the minute. Um, just to say we've got a new website up for the survey um, and we've got a Twitter account which you can follow um, and there's an interactive map of sites online as well. So I'd just like to say thanks to everyone who's helping with the transfer of the survey from JNCC to BTO for coordination, um, all of the partners and the, the advisory group that are helping with the survey, the communications team and IS team at BTO who have really helped with that transition. Uh, and of course, everybody who takes part in seabird monitoring in the UK. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. That's great. I mean, the seabird monitoring programme is clearly vitally important for securing the future of our, our extremely precious seabird populations. Um, and I think we're really fortunate to have somebody so knowledgeable and passionate about seabird in the programme organisers hot seat. And I'm sure everybody online wishes you uh, all the very best of luck with this huge new role. Uh, we've got time for just a couple of questions, if that's all right. Um, firstly, Murray Orchard asks, this is, I think, a follow up to something that um, Juliet showed in her talk, actually, um, the increase in ring recoveries of um, great skewers or bonksies. Murray's question is, is there a possibility that the avian flu um, decline of bonksies might help Arctic skewers recover? Yeah, that is an interesting one. And, and we have wondered about that because some of the Arctic skewer colonies did rather well last year <laughs> and that could be a, co a coincidence it doesn't mean that the two are linked um, but they could be so that would 
to, to have an answer to that, we'd have to actually uh, look into it specifically. But yeah, so um, a couple of the, the worries that we have for Arctic skuas are either direct predation of either the eggs or on feral. We used to see that the chicks would actually fledge and be doing their first kind of few flights and, and then the great skuas would eat, eat the Arctic skuas. So um, there is pressure from that species. Um, it just depends if it's making a population um, scale difference. Okay, thanks, Sarah. And then just one more question for now, and that's from Keith Clarkson, who I presume is the famous Vesmig in Keith Clarkson. He says he's curious to know why Flamborough and Filey Coast colony, which includes Bempton, Sports' largest UK mainland colony and England's largest seabird colony um, is not a key site. That's a good question. And it is something that um, we have been speaking about um, in our meetings. Um, and I think we are reviewing the sampling strategy for the seabird monitoring programme. So we're looking at which sites are surveyed and um, where the gaps are. Um, that includes looking at the key sites as well. Um, there isn't an English uh, key site at the minute. Um, there also isn't a huge amount of funding to just add new key sites. So we are going to have a, a proper review, sampling review using scientists at BTO to figure out exactly what we need to do next. But yes, that's a good question. And it's come up a couple of times in meetings. That's great, Sarah. We'll have to leave it there. Thanks so much for your Thank talk. Thank you. Fantastic. I'm going to move on to the final talk of today's session, which will be given by uh, Neil Calbraid. Uh, many of you who are listening today will know Neil. He's been at the BTO for more than 20 years, during which time he's been, uh, he spent a lot of his time as a core part of the Wetland Bird Survey team. Uh, he's an obsessive wildlife recorder and an amazing photographer of the wildlife that frequents the BTO Nunnery Reserves, the Nunnery Lakes Reserve. Indeed, it's a rare day for me when the first sound that my phone makes in the morning isn't the Nunnery Lakes WhatsApp group pinging with a message from Neil about what he's already seen that morning, usually along with a blinding record shot of said subject. Um, it didn't give me any pleasure at all to uh, a couple of summers ago bump into a, a little bittern on Neil's patch, uh, indeed at a location that he probably walked past about an hour or two before. Well, I'm pleased to say he did catch up with the little bittern, so I felt much better about it. And Neil's role has changed recently to include responsibility for the Goose and Swan monitoring programme, which he's going to tell us about now. Well, very warm welcome to you, Neil. Thank you. So I'm just going to talk about the Cruise and Swan Monitoring Programme, which is a, a new survey um, to the BTO. And the main, main people think, a bit, one thing what people ask is why we need to monitor geese and swans. Um, geese and swans are, are present in, in the UK in internationally important numbers. In fact, some species, their whole population winters in the UK. I mean, there's, there's 510, the last population estimates were 510,000 pink feet, 100,000 barnacle geese, about 91,000 Icelandic grey lag geese, 13,000 white fronts, 137,000 Brent geese, and several hundred bean geese. So you can see the sort of numbers of geese that turn up in this country. And also the swans, we can't forget those. There's, there's about 10,000 hooper swans, but, but only about a couple of hundred Buick swans um, that currently um, winter in the UK. As I say, the, the BTO has just recently taken over the, the Goose and Swan Monitoring Programme, or GSMP, which is not to be um, confused with the SMP, which you've just heard about. Um, so WWT used to organise this for many years, and then this, in August this year, um, BTO um, took it over. And so the, goose and, the GSMP monitors the abundance and being success of the, the, make the UK's native geese and migratory swans. So we're talking about the, the ones that come here um, for the winter. We're not interested. We're not looking at the, the Canada geese or the Egyptian geese or the bone mute swans, but all the ones that um, come over here and spend the winter with us. And the GSMP is a suite, it's a suite of species specific surveys um, which looks at the different populations of the geese. And it's partly funded by the BTO, JNCC and Nature Scott. So there's three different organisations who are, are a steering group of this, of this programme. Uh, there's about nine surveys that are carried out, and some of the some are organised by GSMP partners. The, so that's the BTO, GNCC, and Nature Scott. And these are uh, surveys such as the Icelandic Breeding Goose Census, the International Census of Greenland Barnacle Geese, 
the Svalbard Barnacle Goose Census, the International Swan Census, and the Swan and Goose Age Assessments. And there's also various surveys that's carried out by collaborating organisations, uh, such as the Counts and Age Assessments of Tega Bean Geese, the Greenland Whitefront Census, the All Island Light Bellied Brent Goose Census, some tongue twisters in these. And, also, and obviously the BTO um, Wetland Bird Survey, um, which also um, has various uh, different partners. The main survey that BTO organised, that we organised with the BTO, is the Icelandic Bee Goose Census, or the IGC. And one of the main species that we get in this country, as you saw before, is pink fussy goose. And pink fussy geese over the years have numbers of apps have increased um, phenomenally since the mid 80s, um, mostly due to good breeding seasons in Iceland, but also once they, once they get over here in the winter, there's good beet harvests and potatoes and, and more protection for them. So, so, that, so their numbers have really increased over the years. So but, um, the pink feet, I mean, they, they start to arrive from Iceland in about September. So as you see where, so you see all the, the, the blue dots, these are, these are the sites where they um, traditionally occur. And when they first arrive in September, a lot of the birds uh, start off in northern Scotland, around um, Lockers, Draft Bay, uh, Montreal's Basin, and around the 4th. And then some birds do move down the east coast, um, whilst the majority head to, to, to northwest England, so it heads in the southwest direction to northwest England. And the birds in, the, in northwest England, they gather in sort of southwest Lancashire on the Lancashire mosses, sort of around Martin Mee and the Ribble Estuary, and some, some move down to the Dee and the, the Ribble and the Alt. Uh, well, some birds do carry on down the east coast and stay around the Humber, but then most birds do then carry, a lot of birds do carry on down to East Anglia and where there's large flocks on the North, North Norfolk coast, around the Wash and on, some, and on the Broads. And then in winter, then in spring, they, they do reverse migration and back to Iceland for the breeding season. The other species that we look at for the, uh, the IGC is Icelandic um, grey lag geese. And their numbers have are relatively stable, um, though Icelandic grey lag geese are a bit, of a, a bit of an anomaly and a bit of a tricky one to, to census because um, there's the naturalised grey um, lag goose um, population in England, which is slowly, as which is gradually increasing and moving northwards, and also a, a native uh, West Scotland population of grey lag geese, um, which is, used to be around the Hebrides on the west coast of Scotland, but they're spread, um, gradually spreading eastwards. And so they're now, those, both those two populations are now encroaching on where the traditionally Icelandic birds have, have wintered. So, the, so the, trying to ass assess the exa exactly where the Icelandic, which ones are Icelandic and which ones are, are native is getting much more difficult. Um, but we are doing a lot of work into this to try and, to try and work, work this out, but it is very difficult. And so a lot of tracking work and net collars are oft, often used um, for birds that are found from Iceland. It's an, it's an ongoing, it's an annual survey. It's been going on since 1960 um, when the first counts were carried out. And, and there's, there's two counts carried out annually in October and November. Uh, so we've just had the second, um, second count. And there's an additional September count for grey lag geese. And the idea of this ex additional count is that in September you can, you can see what grey lag geese are present already before the Icelandic birds come arrive. Um, and then you can basically take, uh, try hopefully to subtract, subtract those from the Iceland, from the num total numbers down during the rest of the winter to give you a rough idea of how many true, true Icelandic birds have arrived. And the counts are carried out predominantly at dawn or dusk, but there are some um, daytime feeding flocks. And as, as just saw before, the, this is the, 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 all, all the IGC sites that we have. In the country, you can see there's a very northerly bias and, and bias through in the east and on the, on the west coast and, and Lancashire. So, it's, so if, you're in the, if you're in the south, you do miss out, you won't be able to take part in the survey. Um, but if you're interested in taking part and you're in any of the areas where there's red dots and you enjoy counting vast numbers of um, geese at dawn or dusk, um, then please get in touch and you can take part in this one. Another species that we get in this country is barnacle geese. And there's three distinct populations um, that occur in Britain. And there's, in, there's a Greenland population, that, about 56,000 of those that come down and winter on the west coast of Scotland and around, and around the um, Irish coast. And, there's, and, these, and since, since 1984, these have been monitored on Isla. And they, these are monitored by NatureScot, 
And then every, every three years, they do a full census of the whole population and by using aerial survey. There's also another population of about 43,000 birds from Svalbard, um, which come down. And this is the whole population, of the whole Svalbard breeding population winters, and predominantly on the Solway estuary in, Cum in, Cumbria, Scot in the Cumbria Scottish border, and also some a few thousand over in Lindisfarne up in Northumberland. And then there's another population which winters up in, which breeds in Russia and then winters on the near continent, um, but these aren't included in GSMP. And there's also another population uh, which isn't included on this map of naturalised barnacle geese, which breed in the south of England, and they're steadily increasing to about 2,000, 2,500 of these um, now. And, and again, they could become a problem in, in future years, similar to the Icelandic grey lag geese, where these um, naturalised barnacle geese will start wintering in areas that some of them already start um, wintering, breeding near um, the near the Solway. So they, they could mask um, the true um, wintering birds eventually. And there's not forgetting the swans. We've got, we've got lots of swans that, are, that turn up in this country. If you ever go to Martin Mio, the Wellnies, you see all the big, the vast numbers of swans, especially the hoop swans. And hoop swans are really doing well in this, uh, in this country. As uh, so that number is steadily increasing as the populations are increasing um, across the board. Conversely, we've got Buick swans. And these used to be very, very, very numerous, especially around um, Slimbridge uh, sort of area, but now the numbers have steadily declined. And these, these birds have seen large declines over the whole population. But also there's a lot of short stopping that's happening with birds that are coming, coming from the east, that, from their East and their Russian and Siberian breeding grounds. They're coming across from the east to, to the UK. And as the, the winters are getting warmer, um, the, the birds are ne therefore not having feeling the need to come across to us as they used to, because formerly the Netherlands and areas like that would be frozen in the winter. So they'd have to come and carry on to us. Whereas nowadays, the, with the warmer winters, there's much more habitable, habitable um, habitat in further east that they can stop on. And this is happening across, this is with happening with, with many water birds. And then every five years, there's a, an international swan census. So if you, again, if you've got swans, um, either Buick or Hooper swans in, in your area, and would like any water body in, can, be, can be done for this census, and you would like to take part, then a date for your diary, um, for 2025. So in January 2025, we'll be in the next International Swan Census. Uh, so that's doing a full census of the whole breeding, the whole wintering population of, all, of both of the yellow-billed swans. Another species which is quite a specialised species is the white-fronted goose. And this is the, the most, mainly the, the green, there's two populations, the green and white front, and then the Eurasian or Russian white-fronted goose. And for JSMP, we monitor the, the, goose, the, the green and white fronted geese. And these are, these are monitored by the, goose and, the green and white front study group. And also, and there's, there's also recently been an ECHOES popula uh, population of birds that have been monitored by the ECHOES project, which BTO are partner in. And this has been carried out on, Dangle, on, on Anglesey and, and other sites in Wales. And they've been doing some net collaring work and some tracking work. The main population of green and white fronts is on the west coast of Scotland and over in Ireland, but there are smaller populations in, in Wales. And there used to be a, a tiny population which turned up on a small lake near, near me up in, up in Manchester, which we, everybody thought was escape, were just escaped birds. And then one turned up with a collar, neck collar, and we realised that they actually were wild, wild geese. But these, but these, but did all these radio tracking and net collaring um, work has been fan, been fantastic. As you saw with Sarah's talk, some of these radio tracking um, information that we can get, it just sh shines a big light on where birds go, and we can produce tracks like this so you can see where the birds, um, how the birds move during their migration. So this is a, a green and white front that wintered on Anglesey and then went to, went to um, Iceland, stopped off there briefly, and then moved back to Greenland, then back to breed. And then it'll have done the reverse uh, migration in the following winter. Possibly the rarest goose um, that we get in the UK are the bean geese. And the, the tundra bean geese do, um, are one of those species that do turn up in, um, in random places. So they're not very well monitored by, um, by the JSMP, but are monitored by webs. Um, but the tiger, the tiger bean geese, uh, tiger bean goose is a species that is monitored and very well by um, the, the, the bean goose action group. And there's two populations of tiger bean geese in the UK. There's a population up in the 
um, Savannah Plateau, which is just in which is near Falkirk. And there's another population in the Yare Valley in, in Norfolk. And as you can see from this graph, the, just the two populations have had mixed fortunes over the years. The tiger in the Yare Valley, there used to be up to about 500 birds, uh, but this population is now declining so much. And it's and this last winter, I think there were only about six birds present. And people in the area thought it was literally just one pair that had brought their young. So it, it, it's possible that this year there may not be actually be any birds um, coming back to North to coming back to Norfolk. Um, conversely, up in Scotland, the population up on the Slaman and Plateau has been sort of fairly steady. Slow, it is declining a little bit, um, but it's mostly due to um, poor breeding season, poor breeding success that this these birds are declining. Though some, though there is also part of the reason is, is the short stopping issue, as I mentioned with uh, with Buick swans, where birds coming coming from the far east are not are now not coming as far across as they used to. And the Bean Goose Action Group have done a lot of work. Um, around the Slaman and Plateau on the population there, and they've done a lot of neck collared neck collar birds and satellite tagging and GPS tra tracking, so they can follow the birds either on the migration, so you can see the birds how the birds move through Scandinavia on their way to um, to the UK, and you can see the, the, where the population is in the UK, that little the, the green dot there, and also within a site, so within within the Slaman and Plateau, they can help they can see exactly where the birds are, which fields the birds are using. And what habitats they're using, and so that for, for management plan or for, for conflict, for, for so to avoid conflict of the species, um, because they do like to be on agricultural land. So, so, the, so the, a lot of this, a lot of this data is very widely used, and it's, it's a brilliant, brilliant bit of um, research which has been ongoing since the early nineties. And finally, the, the other species, the other um, goose species we get in this country are the Brent geese, and as with barnacle geese, there's several different populations that we get. We get about 35,000 um, ne Nearctic light-bellied Brent geese. Um, so if you've ever seen Brent geese, you know that they've got different colored bellies depending on where they come from. So we've got the light bellies that come from the Nearctic and also from Svalbard. So about three and a half thousand birds come from Svalbard and they come in winter on, on mostly, mostly birds on Lindisfarne, whereas the Nearctic birds tend to, a lot of them stay in, in Ireland, Northwest England, and some, some um, are, are in um, Wales as well. And then, the, the, then there's dark bellied Brent geese, which come from the east, and there's about, about 98,000 of those, and they winter from the, sort of the wash, uh, from the Humber, right down to the wash, down to the southeast, and, and some across to the, just into the southwest of so Dorset, and a few birds will, will penetrate down into Devon and Cornwall. So you can see these three different populations of different of, of geese, all coming from different areas, but all, all come into winter in the UK. And the, and the Brent geese um, are mostly, uh, the, the, the Nearctic birds are spot, um, in Ireland are monitored by the Irish um, Brent goose group. Um, but they also, the, the, Brent, the Brent geese that are on the, um, the dark belly Brent geese and the Svalbard Brent geese are monitored by webs. And in fact, a lot of, and now, and now that BTO has taken over um, GSMP, webs, and, webs will be reporting on the, the GSMP um, results. In, for, in future. And it, we all, in fact, web, web report online for those who haven't seen it. Um, it's an amazing online resource, and we already do um, share the GSMP data. Uh, so you can see, so you can see every species has its own um, thing page. And the, on, the, on the tables, the, you can see the, the orange um, cells, which are supplementary counts. And these are often um, GSMP surveys. Uh, so, so, so very often you've got swan censuses. Or you've got the you've got all the different various um, survey or the various other surveys, and especially the IGC. And so a lot of these numbers um, give a better better in, uh, idea of the numbers of the birds than webs um, counts do. Because web, web, webs counts are carried out predominantly on water waterways and water bodies, um, whereas a lot of the geese and swan, a lot of the geese certainly do spend a lot of their days away from the away from water bodies and so get missed by water by webs. And finally, another the one, another feature of um, GSMP are age, are age assessments, and these are carried these are carried out to, to determine the annual rep reproductive success of each goose and swan population, and these are carried out each winter on autumn um, winter and autumn stopover sites. And so, there's two different measures of reproductive success that we can we can um, look at by assessing the age assessment of different flocks. We can look at the proportion of young birds 
in the non-breeding flock. So here you've got a, an adult bent goose, a couple of adult bent geese with the nice um, net, white neck collar and with a, with a juvenile down on the left and the bottom left, which lacks the neck collar. So these are quite an easy species um, to age. Some of them, other ones are a bit, bit trickier. And we also look at the average brood size. So, so if you're doing this flock, you'd say that's a pair with one chip, with one, one young. But well, it's good to know how many, how good the breeding success has been. And different species have different periods when it's good, it's, when, in, when its age assessments are, are possible. So for dark belly brain geese, that, that's in most of the cross, most of the winter because uh, the, the young don't molt too easily, but some too early. But some species that as they as the winter goes on, the young have molted, so they virtually look like adults by the time they by the time they bred or by the time they leave. Another species which is quite easy to um, assess are the, are the swans. So here, so here you've got a nice pair of swans with three signets, and they can they can be done throughout most of the winter. But let's say there is a focus on January. Um, when there the, are the age assessments carried out, um, or like a, a collaborative age assessment carried out each year, in, in, a, in addition to the International Swan Census. And, and so for, all the, for all this work, we've, we've created a new um, online system um, to go to, to which is similar to the web's online system we've already got, um, which is for GSMP online. And we only got the, the contract for GSMP in August. So this so GSMP online was has to be put together fairly quickly, um, so that it hasn't got all the bells and whistles that some of other um, online system recording systems have got. Um, but it is something we will be building in the, as as um, as we go on. And for the moment, we can you can enter your IGC counts or your age assessments um, through this um, interface. And as as has already been mentioned on various on the on the talk, especially with Sarah's talk with seabirds. Um, avian influenza is, is a massive, a massive um, issue um, with wildfowl. And, and on the last year, on the on the Solway, the big pop, let's say the, the, the whole population, Svalbard po um, population of barnacle geese, um, winter on the Solway, uh, most uh, winter on the Solway. And last year, about forty thousand birds, about forty thousand birds there, and about eight, eight to ten thousand birds um, died from avian influenza. And this is how, and then people had to go out and do the counts of the dead birds. And so this is, so you can see at the, at the, at the bottom of the screen there, there's a dead, a dead bird which has been colour marked um, so that they, when they're doing the counts, they don't double count. And obviously, avian influenza is an ongoing issue um, with, across all species. And so this year, there will be more surveys carried out to, to, to assess exactly how the different populations of the, of the geese um, get affected. I and mean, if this, if avian influenza, um, got into the be the bean geese, for instance, the take of bean geese from the Saman and Plateau. There's only 200 of those. It could it could easily wipe out that particular breeding for that wintering population. So it's, it could it's so it's, it's something that's very serious in in waterfowl, especially and this it's coming winter. So there's a lot of work being done, a lot of monitoring being done through through webs and through GSMP um, into into looking at the impacts of AI. So I'd like to thank everybody who, who makes this work possible. The, the various different survey groups who do who do the JSMP, the co colleagues from BTO, the, the partnership, and of, of course all the volunteers who do who go out and do all the counts all win every winter in in all weathers. So thank you very much. Thanks, Neil. That's great. I'm sure the Goose and Swan Monitoring Program will be in safe hands with uh, you and the rest of the. Web's team. Uh, there's clearly big advantages, I imagine, to having clo closer integration between this program and uh, what you've talked about in Web's. I wondered if you could say a bit more about what you think the kind of big opportunities are there. Um, that, yeah, we do have a we have we've always had a good relationship with the WWT and the JSMP. We've received their data every winter, but it's, but it's good to get the two um, speaking to get uh, get them all under the same roof, basically. And then be, you can and so with the recording, a lot of the recording will now and the w, and web space will and, the, and JSMP will be recorded together under the web report online and into the newsletters. So there'll be a lot more um, joined up thinking with it with the recording of the of all the different species and how the different species can be. And there's a lot more work to be done, especially with around the Icelandic grey lag -like geese and updating a few some of the uh, some of the uh, censuses and uh, maybe may need to be tweaked um, as New, as new as we look at more and work onto into different populations. 
Uh, thanks, Neil. Um, I don't know if you can answer this or not. Claire Williams asks why WWT stopped running the Goose and Swan monitoring program. Are you able to share that? Um, WWT have done a, a, a broad scale. They've, had, they've cut back on a lot of their conservation work, and they've had, and they've stopped becoming a partner in, web, in wetland bird survey as well. They've they've got they've they've decided, they've worked out they've they've got conservation strategies elsewhere that they want to um, look at, and so they they just, they stopped doing the WWT. And then they stopped doing the GSMP, and and then they say got handed over to but on tender, which BTO and then took over. Thanks very much. And a question from Vanessa Halhead: What's the current position thinking about wildfowling? There seems to be increasing concern about it in local communities around the Cromarty and Murray Firth, especially in light of all the other pressures on these birds. Um, I'm not really sure. Different species, obviously, different species get um, the natural England and and, and and nature Scott do a lot of work on the looking at um, wild fowling and and numbers and, and all that type of thing. So it's so it's more that it's so from our point of view, we we're just monitoring the numbers and we can provide we can provide the data um, for the other for the organisations to be able to assess the impacts of wild fowling on on populations. Obviously, with AI. Um, it's, there's obviously some species that now uh, may become a bit more um, a, a, a bit more threatened by uh, by such things, and so obviously wildfowling is, an, is just an extra pressure that they, they may not need. But as, as as time goes on, we'll know more about it, and and we can say we can, the data can be be used to assess these things, and and hopefully, um, yeah. And if it, if wildfowling needs to be stopped in areas and to allow populations to recover, then then we can then they, then that could be done or Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it depends how it's yeah, upon what the data, the data shows, really. Thanks, Neil. I think we have to leave it there. But um, there's a couple more comments for you from Keith Cowison in the in the Q and A box that you might like to respond to. And thank you again for your contribution this afternoon. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I hope everybody online's enjoyed this uh, session of free talks. I'd like to thank all the speakers for their fascinating contributions, and all of you, of course, for giving up your time to join us. Um, as I mentioned at the start, now more than ever, our research relies on your support. There are lots of ways to support us, and many of you already do great things for us, um, both as members and as volunteers and donors. Um, as you know, now there's a, a custom conference link, which you can see on your screens now for where you can make a donation should you choose to, so to do so. I hope you can join us for more talks during the week. The next session is tomorrow when we've got a tremendous trio of trackers giving us talks on their uh, work on curlew, goosander and shellduck tracking, which I'm sure is going to be fascinating. And I just wanted to give a quick plug for our uh, Friday Night with the Bee lecture, which I'm sure is going to be amazing. It's by Professor Pete Mara, who will be hopefully joining us uh, live from Paraguay. Uh, rather worryingly, he uh, told us yesterday that it's a 10 hour drive from his remote field work location to his hotel to pick up his Wi-Fi. So I'm really hoping he makes it back there in time. He's an amazing scientist and an absolutely uh, fantastic speaker. So it'll be well worth tuning in on Friday. So uh, that's all for today. Until uh, the same time tomorrow, uh, thanks very much for joining us and I hope you have a good rest of day. <laughs>